Well, it's one of those things when you schedule it, and then you look at the calendar and you go, oh no. <laughs> <laughs> what was I thinking? <laughs> but uh, again, I just really I do appreciate all you guys for taking your time out of your busy schedules and coming. So let's go ahead and pray and we will get started. Father God, we just come to you, Lord, and we just thank you so much, God, for the opportunity, Father, just to share your word with people, Lord. And I'm just so thankful for these that have showed up, Lord, to continue to uh, learn how we can uh, just lead people to you, Father God, and, and help them to understand their decisions, Father, that they make for you, Lord. So I pray you bless our time, God, and just help us to uh, just to learn maybe a, a, some new truths tonight, God, how to apply some new truths to our lives and how to share that with others, Father. So we ask you to bless this time in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, again, I just really do Appreciate you guys coming and you know this training is really more like guidelines and then it is an actual process or anything that you have to memorize so that maybe it'll set your minds at ease a little bit it's not a whole lot of memory that you have in fact I've given you some help help you, you know some guides there that'll help you uh, you know learn this and help you guide you through that process but tonight we're really going to talk about more actual ways and actual scenarios how to lead or lead someone to Christ or how to help them to understand, maybe if they're coming down to rededicate their life, how, you know, to help them to understand what that really means. And, and so we're going to look at those things tonight. And, uh, you know, you've, you've received a, a commitment guide there, that little laminated guide. I want you to keep that with your Bible. We'll go over it a little bit later. And also the material there that I to keep that, you know, try to refer back to it whenever you get time, read it back there, you know, go through it, kind of, you know, help you to remember some of these things we're going to be talking about. We're not going to go through that entire thing word for word tonight, but we're going to kind of go down to it and we will highlight some of those areas. But, uh, you know, I'm going to teach you how to also make a road map in your Bible. I know some of you guys were here last time you learned how to do that. But, if, you know, you ever heard of a road map in your Bible where you can go and mark your Bible and it'll help you tell you the next scripture, the next scripture, the next scripture to go to? It's pretty cool. So if you, if you did bring your Bibles, go ahead and turn it to uh, Romans 3.23. This is a great place to start out when you're uh, leading someone to the Lord or helping them understand what salvation is from the Bible. And so if you turn your Bible to Romans um, 3.23 there, and uh, once you find your place there, what I want you to do is just mark a number one right there at Romans 3.23. And if you didn't bring your Bibles there, you can just write it down on the back of your sheet there and you can do it when you get home. But if you'll take there and mark that number one, that's going to be your first starting place. You might even... Put your uh, commitment guide there uh, as a placekeeper so you can automatically turn there if you should need to. Uh, your commitment guide will kind of go along with this, but this is just another tool to help you, uh, you know, to go through that. And because if you're like me, I, I like to take people through the scriptures. I, I, the guide is to kind of help you to, to memorize. If you lose your place, you know where to go kind of thing. But I like to you know, have people, and sometimes I will even ask them to read that scripture and ask them, do you understand what that means? So when you, when you mark your number one there, I want you to write above that number one, I want you to write Romans 6.23, right above that. Because when you get to Romans 6.23, that's your next stop. That's telling you that's the first place you start, and Romans 6.23 is where you're going to go next. And when you get there, I want you to mark a little number two right there. That's your second stop. And right above that, you can write John 3.3. 3. And after you get John 3, 3 written there, I want you to go ahead and, and uh, turn to your Bible at John 3, 3. Okay, and once you're there, if I can find it, once you're at John 3, 3, you go ahead and, and just mark a number, another 3 there, number 3. And then right there, I want you to write the verse John 14, 6. And after you write the John 14, 6 there, go ahead and turn there. And John 14, 6. You can write your little number 4 there. And you can also go ahead and write there Romans 9 or excuse me, Romans 10, verse 9, and 10. And then you could turn to Romans. Okay, 
there you would not write your little number five there and then you would write second corinthians 5 17 is the next stop on the little road map there excuse me uh, 517 and there it's 2nd Corinthians 517 you want to write there your little number 6 and then write Romans 323 there And that'll kind of bring you all back to it right there. So there's a little road map. It'll make a little bit more sense to you as, we'll go through, as we go through the training night. It'll make more sense to you. So I just want to go ahead and give you that so you have it already marked down for yourselves. And, uh, you know, we're going to start off by understanding really what our role is as a commitment counselor. And uh, so we're just going to look at, you know, one of the roles of a commitment counselor there. If you look at your sheet there, right on down is where it says section number one, it says, what is the role of a commitment counselor? We're going to look at that tonight. We're going to look at uh, what are some of the skills that you will use. We're going to also look at some of the steps in commitment counseling. And also, um, you know, when does the role of a commitment counselor begin? Because that's very, very important. And also, we're going to streamline, and uh, what you're going to do is what your homework is, is streamline and practice telling your story, if, you know, how you got saved, you know, in two minutes or less. That's very important that you learn how to do that. Not the full-blown, I was born in, you know, and I was raised as. Not that one, man. Just cut to the chase. Be able to share what happened to you in two minutes. That's going to be your homework. So that's a very important part. So, those are, those are the five things that we're going to be looking at uh, tonight as we move through this. And so let's talk about the role of what we do. You know, with rare exceptions, um, men always counsel with men and boys, okay? And women counsel with women and young ladies. Sometimes, if the need be, sometimes women, you know, will we'll pair a woman up with maybe a, a child or, or, or a young adult, and, and that's okay. Sometimes, it, you know, with rare exception, uh, a guy will counsel a lady. I had to do that yesterday, not, not had to, I had to privilege of doing that yesterday and what was cool when Stephanie came in the sanctuary and I called her over there man she, she was able to share us we actually got to lead a lady to the Lord yesterday after second service so that was just really awesome and she got saved so but that's pretty much what we will do it's you know we'll always pair off guys with guys women with women basically and uh but you're, you're, you know, you're, one of your four main duties is that we, we want to clarify the decision. That's one thing that you're going to find when doing this, that people really don't understand many times why they're coming down. You'd think, you'd, you know, as Pastor Eric gets that invitation, that people would understand why they're coming down. I want to receive Christ or I want to rededicate. But a lot of times they simply do not understand. So we want to make sure that they understand their decision and that we also understand it so that we can move on to the right place. But we assist them by using that commitment by making that always by using the Bible we always use the Word of God and uh, that's why it's good to have it pre-marked or to have your little laminated sheet there uh, but we want to help the commitment maker to complete the commitment record that I've given you too uh, if you look at that it just has what, what you I want you to do on this is uh, we put the date you put their name or you it's best to have them write this okay it's, it's that's what I always do always have them fill that portion out and their name, address, city, phone number, email, birthday. And then, you know, and, and if they're married, single, or whatever. And then I stop them. I say, I'll get the rest. It's like, I, I'm going to probably change these up and have them, you know, to be filled out by a counselor or something else right there. So a line draws so they stop right there. Because you really don't want them to check if they're coming to accept Christ or rededication at that point. And there's a good reason. We'll get back into that in just a little bit. But um, the role of a, a counselor really should begin actually when right before you come service man or when you're driving here or when you pull up in the parking lot that's where your role really begins because that's when you're going to start praying and asking god to you know, send his holy spirit and and to, to be in the service and to prompt those that are hearts that need to make a decision that's what our one of our huge responsibilities are, are to pray for the service pray for the pastor you know pray that he would be able to uh you know uh, give the message well that people would understand it and it would the Holy Spirit would just have his way and move on the hearts of his people That's a huge role that we have you know our role is just not just counseling But it also includes you know praying for those people in the service that they would make that decision that they wouldn't let anything You know hinder them from making that decision so you know and 
the counselors, we should always be seated in different places in the auditorium. We don't all need to be sitting down front, but just in different places. It's really important that we're in all these different areas. And, and uh, you know, the, you know, when people come down, um, the first step is actually just to lead it. We'll take them off, like Pastor Eric will give the invitation. They'll come down. We will escort them, to, usually to the side of those seats right over there. Sometimes we can take them back here if we have nothing going on, but we'll take them up first thing. We'll sit down, and the first question right off the bat is, what decision have you come to make? They may not know. Don't be surprised at that, but they may say, you know, I, I want to receive Jesus Christ, or I want to rededicate my life, and so at that point, you want to go ahead and have them fill out the sheet right there, but don't let them check off those parts just yet. Just hold off from that, but it's real important that we are deliberate in clarifying the decision or help them clarify the decision they're making. Sometimes, you know, when you ask them, what decision have you come to make? Man, they'll want to drag it out. I mean, they'll want to give you the full, long, long story. And so you want to help them to be deliberate to find out why you're coming. And we don't want to be rude, but we want to be deliberate. And, and, and as soon as you understand what their, their decision is, that's where you want to move to your next step at that point. Right? So try to be deliberate without being rude. It's really important. But, um, you know, in part two there, look at what are some of the skills that a commitment counselor uses. Number one, very important. Can't stress this one enough. Be discerning. You know, don't take for granted that the commitment that they are making is the one that they need to make. And that question might kind of catch you back for saying, well, who are we to judge that? Well, there's a lot of good reasons for this. For example, they may come for rededication, but they may never, never maybe have ever accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior. They're thinking they're trusting on church membership or things like that. They're thinking, well, I haven't been to church in two years, so I need to rededicate my life. It may be that they've never trusted Jesus Christ in the first place. So we're going to uh, cover that a little bit more in the next session. But the, the thing I want to stress is just be discerning. And, and the next thing, listen well. You know, good listening skills are, are, are so vital to being an effective counselor and helping people lead them to a decision or helping them walk through a decision they've made. So be, uh, be a good listener. Be, you'll learn how to pick up on certain things as you, as you talk to people. And, you know, one of the most important goals of counseling session is to assist that person in achieving a clear understanding of that commitment that they are coming to make and achieving that goal will require you, everybody to really listen real carefully. So be patient. That's the next one. You know, allow the decision maker, uh, the commitment maker to... Um, some time to consider what the Word of God is, is, is saying. And a lot of times when you're moving through the Bible, hey, you got to understand, we may know this stuff, okay, but they may not. And so you got to give them time to kind of digest that and understand. The lady that we led to the Lord this past weekend, I took her for all the way from starting uh, at Adam and Eve and after everything I explained to her. And, and the funny thing was is I didn't have my Bible with me, but it was so cool because God was so good. Where he was helping me memorize all these scriptures and they were just popping off the top of my head. And the thing that I asked her after every time says, does that make sense to you? And she goes, yeah, it does. I can move on. So we want to make sure and, and allow them the time to be able to understand it. And, um, you know, look for signs that they either understand or they don't. You know, sometimes this is a deer in the headlight kind of look, you know, they're obviously not understanding. So maybe just say the same thing, but maybe use different analogies or a different way to say it to help them to understand. And so, you know, and don't give them too much information. Very, very important. Because here's the thing. In a counseling session, you're typically only going to have about seven to ten minutes. Ten minutes is kind of stretching it, actually, because here's the thing. They may have kids in the nursery or they may have some relatives or whoever waiting on them. They're hungry, they're ready to go, and, and you're, you know, so be careful that, that you, you practice this and be able to kind of walk somebody through this in about seven to 10 minutes. And one thing that I like to do is I ask them, are you, do you have any kids in the nursery? If they say no, or are, you, are you here with anybody? Then that kind of gives you the freedom maybe uh, to spend a little more time if you need, but be, be conscious of that. Uh, part three, you know, steps in commitment counseling. Um, these steps, again, start in the par parking lot. Pray for the moving of the Holy Spirit. Uh, check in um, with a counselor or leader, and we are establishing these leaders. Uh, but check in with whoever that is, uh, either it's myself or maybe even Stephanie, to let someone know that you're here and you're available to counsel. That's very, very important. 
Um, you know, during the invitation, keep your eyes open to see if you are needed. Uh, sometimes Pastor Eric does not call people to forward. That's because he doesn't feel led. Or he may see people that raise their hand that raise their hand all the time. Very, very common. So a lot of times you think, well, why didn't he call them forward? For some, the, sometimes there's a reason. Or maybe he just not, just, just doesn't feel led to. And, and he has the freedom to do that. But if you see somebody raising their hand or you sense people raise their hand, be ready. If he calls them and they start walking forward, you come forward too. It does two things. It makes people feel more comfortable about coming forward. And, and so, and, and plus it puts us in the position to go ahead and ready and take them off to decide to counsel them. Um, you know, so people raise their hand, indicate, just go ahead and when Pastor Eric uh, asks them to come forward, just be ready at that time and start moving towards the front. As the counseling session begins, be warm and friendly and put them at ease because this is a lot, a lot of times, as you'll find out, uh, it's a very emotional time for a lot of people, so try to put them at ease, man. Put on a big old smile and help them feel as comfortable as you possibly can. Um, you know, have them fill out the personal information again, and uh, use that to remember their name. Refer to them by their name, because I'm constantly, sometimes, you know how I'm bad about names, so I'm constantly looking down at that commitment record so that I talk to them and call them by their name. It's really important. That also helps to put them at ease. Uh, you want to ask a transition question. You know, what decision have you come to make? What commitment? I usually, I like to word, use the word commitment versus decision. So what commitment are you coming to make? It puts a greater emphasis on why they're coming down. A commitment is a little bit deeper than a decision. So I ask them, what commitment have you come to make? And they may not know again, so be prepared for that. Uh, the, the second to last one there, clarify the decision by restating it as you understand it. Because a lot of times, again, they will not understand. And at the end of the session, complete the commitment record. That's where you'll write on there, this person got saved, or this person rededicated their life, you know. They want it. They want to follow through with baptism. And so you will fill that part out. But um, during the counsel session, use your Bible and the commitment guide. So just, you know, I know a lot of times we live in the age to where we have smartphones and, and you know, we're depending on the screen to get those verses. But get in the habit of bringing your Bible to church. It's very important you know, that they see this from the Word of God. But as the counseling session concludes, um, be sure to tell them, you know, what their next step is going to be. That's one of the most important things that we can do. If they're coming down for salvation, what, what's the next step? Baptism. Got to tell them about baptism, okay? And so those, those things are very important. And, and uh, be sure to, you know, that the commitment record is completed. Uh, you know, and go ahead and sign it because if, if there's some comments on the bottom there, a little line for comment, you may write on there, you know, this person needs some follow-up a little bit more. You know, maybe you didn't have a, a, a really good session with them and, and you just didn't feel like, you feel like they need to know more, okay? So you can write that on there, let, put your name on there so I know how to get back with you and ask you a little bit about it. Uh, part four. You know, streamline again. Uh, we talked about this a little bit ago. Streamline and practice telling your story in two minutes. Everyone that's trusted Jesus Christ has a story to tell, right? So we all have a long version. Like I said earlier, I got the long version and I got the really, really short version. I mean, I can, I can tell it in less than two minutes or I can give you the five-minute version, but we want to do that two-minute version. So practice streamline. Just, and here's the points you want to, uh, the, the parts that your, you know, your testimony should consist of. Uh, right there it says, our story should consist of three main parts. What our life was before our salvation experience, um, what happened, you know, in other words, how we got saved, what, what brought us to that point, and that would be my phone that I didn't silence. Sorry, Mom. But uh, the next thing, but what happened? You know, how, how did it happen? How, you know, how you got to that point? And then, and then how our life has changed from that point. Now, as I said, you know, what, you know, how, how is our life like before salvation? Don't let that bother you if you're one of those persons that, man, I was raised in church. I never remember a time not being in church. I, I wasn't out there in the world, you know, so my life, there wasn't that big radical change. That doesn't matter. Everybody still had a time and a place. And I don't, when I say time, I don't mean that 1240, you know, in, in the afternoon on Sunday, you know, I don't mean that. I mean an event. There was a point in a time in your life where you realized it could have been as a young child. Andy Stanley, one of my favorite pastors, preachers, he got saved when he was six years old, got an amazing, but he still had a clear understanding, man, that he wanted to live his life for Jesus. And from that point on, he did. So you don't have to have the big, you know, sex, drug, rock and roll testimony, but there just has to have a time that you can explain to someone, man, there was a, came a point in time in my life, I don't care if it was six or 60, 
that I came, I, there was something happened that I wanted to know Jesus Christ and I wanted that relationship with him more than anything. And so I asked him into my heart. And then you get to share with him how your life has changed. If anybody is in Christ, it's one of the scripture verses that you wrote down on your road map, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away, all things become new. So there's, those are the three components of, a, of a, a, a testimony. The Apostle Paul gives the best exam, uh, example of Scripture of a, a, a two-minute testimony, and it's found in Acts 29, uh, or Acts 26, verses 9 through 20. His testimony is actually three times in the book of Acts, but this is, this is probably the, most, uh, the best one that I like. But look at it, it says, he says, uh, this is Paul's life before salvation. This is a great example. He goes, I used to believe that I ought to do everything I could to oppose the very name of Jesus, the Nazarene. He says, indeed, I did just that in Jerusalem. Authorized by the leading priest, I caused many believers there to be sent to prison. I cast my vote against them when they were condemned to death. Many times I had punished in the synagogues to get them to curse Jesus. I was so violently opposed to them that I even chased them down in foreign cities. So here's Paul's conversion, verse 12. He goes, one day I was on such a mission to Damascus, armed with the authority and the commission of the leading priest about noon. He says, your majesty, as I was on the road, a light from heaven brighter than the sun shone down on me and my companions. We fell, we all fell down, and I heard a voice saying to me in Aramaic, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is useless for you to fight against my will. Who are you, Lord? I asked. And the Lord replied, I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting. Here's how his life changed from that moment. He goes in verse 16, he goes, he goes and now or get to your feet, for I have appeared to you to appoint you as my servant and witness. You are to tell the world what you have seen and what I will show you in the future. And I will rescue you from both your own people and the Gentiles. Yes, I am sending you to the Gentiles to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God. Then they will receive forgiveness for their sins and be given a place among God's people who are sent, set apart by faith in me. And so, King Agrippa, I obeyed that vision from heaven. I preached first to the, those in Damascus, then in Jerusalem and throughout Judea, and also to the Gentiles that all must repent of their sins and turn to God and prove that they have changed by the good things that they do. So here's those three components of a testimony that we actually see in Scripture. So your homework, again, is to review that part right there. Understand that, just read that and say, you know what? I want to streamline my testimony and be able to capture just what Paul did. Just share before what happened and how your life's changed. And so having said all that, let's move on to counseling for salvation. We're going to start talking about some actual scenarios of how to uh, not only lead someone to the Lord, but how to understand you know, help them understand their need for salvation. So uh, review the, the, the five steps of the commitment counseling again. We'll go over that one more time. Have them fill out that personal, that part of the uh, commitment record and then ask a question, what commitment have you come to make? And uh, depending on their commitment, you know, move to the appropriate next step, whether it's counseling for salvation or rededication. Conclude the session by telling them what the appropriate next step should be for them. And the big one, Pray for them at that point. And then number five, complete the commitment record. So look at counseling for salvation there. When counseling for salvation, our obligation is to lead them to a clear understanding of their need for salvation and the way to receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior from the Word of God. There's four uh, key components that we are going to use to help them understand God's plan of salvation. Those components are God's purpose, our problem, God's provision and our response to that, okay? So begin with salvation counseling session by expressing to them your congratulations for making the most important you know, decision that they could ever make in their life and a good transitional question to use uh, to begin that, that session once you understand they're coming because they want to receive Jesus. Um, you know, would you mind, this is something that I personally use, would you mind if we take a few minutes from the Word of God, from the Bible, to understand what it means to be a Christian? 
that's where your roadmap comes in really handy or that little laminated card. That's where it's going to come in very handy for you. And as you transition into those four key components, start off by helping them to understand that God has a purpose and a plan for their life. They just, just didn't happen by chance. And so use your commitment guide or that roadmap to help you walk through that process. And so God's purpose, you know, God created us to have a relationship with him. These are things that I personally like to share with him. And these are on your commitment uh, card. Uh, the Bible states it this way, that er everything was created through him and for him. And then God loves you and has a purpose for your life. And, and uh, the other point, God offers us eternal life as a gift. God wants us to have a full and meaningful relationship right now and so those are the things that i share with people to help them understand god's purpose for their life and so the next thing is just like the lady that we led to the lord last night she needed to understand her problem you don't get this one a lot when somebody comes up to you and says you know what i know i need to be saved but i don't understand it that's that is just an awesome moment when someone says that so you you get to start from the very point of our problem where our problem began where did our problem begin in the garden, right? Adam and Eve, you, they have to understand their need for salvation before they can really understand salvation. So we, we talked to, talk to them about their need for salvation. It's brought on by one thing, our sin. You know, we have that sin problem. It, it's our sin that separates us from God and from having a relationship with God. And, and we talk about, I talk about Adam and Eve and uh, how they disobeyed God and the result of their sin infected all mankind. That's, we inherited it. And so just like Adam and Eve, uh, it's, it's our sin that separates us from God. That's the part of us. And this lady yesterday, uh, one of the things she, I could tell she was kind of understanding, but what, wasn't understanding. So I said, well, you know, here's the thing. See, we're made up of three parts, just like the, 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 the Trinity. There's God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Well, we're body, soul, and spirit. The body is the part you see. Our soul is who we are. It's our will. It's our intellect. It's, it's who you are inside. You know, you hear somebody say, man, that, that guy's got a big heart. That's who he is. That's his soul. But then in our, there's our spirit. That's where our problem is. See, when we were, we were born into this world, we inherited that sin nature. And I, I explained to her, that's where our problem began because of the sin that entered the world through Adam. We inherited that. So it's our, it's our spirit that is dead to God. God told Adam, the day you eat that fruit, you shall surely die. Now, we know Adam didn't die in that moment, you know, in his physical sense, right? Because he lived for 920 years or whatever, 960, I can't remember, but he lived for like a really, really long time. So, but in that moment, uh, his spirit died. That part, our spirit is that part that communicates with God. It's that part where we pray to God. It's how God's Holy Spirit communicates to us. That's the part, that's where the problem is. That's what had been broken. That's what had been damaged. So the Bible tells us what? And Jesus said in John 3, 3, he says, unless you have been what? Born again, you cannot enter into the kingdom of God unless our dead human spirit has been made alive to God. How does that happen? By receiving Jesus Christ. Instead. Once I explained that to her, you can see the light bulbs clicking on. She got it. She got it. She understood why she needed to have Jesus Christ in her, in, into her life. So it's, it's, that's the, the, one of the most important things as you're explaining salvation to someone, they need to understand our problem. The next thing you would move on to is God's provision. Man, here's the great news right here. The Bible makes it clear that God is holy and just and must punish sin. And God in His mercy and grace has provided forgiveness for our sin. God's gift to us is salvation through Jesus Christ, His Son. And so we want to go on and explain these points to them, how God's provision is Jesus Christ. That's why I had you mark in your roadmap, uh, John 14, 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father but through me. And the next one, that Jesus died on the cross for our sins. And then uh, Jesus is the only acceptable offering for the sin of mankind. And then moving into the, our response to help them to understand no matter how much a person understands facts about Jesus. And again, using the example of the lady yesterday, she understood she had a head knowledge. She knew who Jesus Christ was. She knew who God was. She had a, a, a head knowledge, but she didn't really have a clear understanding of the response. So she, people need to understand. They need to be willing to turn away from their sin. Uh, and turn to God, and repentance is just not just simply, you know, feeling sorry about what you've done, the things that have gone wrong in your life. It's not about repenting. Uh, repentance is not just completely feeling sorry for your sin. 
but we got to also understand that they must place their faith in Jesus Christ. And also that faith is not believing facts about Jesus. And then we must surrender to Jesus Christ as Lord. One of the most important verses that I always share with people is that you must confess in your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in your heart that God has raised from the dead, you will be saved. For it was by believing in your heart, and I always make sure people understand, hey, this is not a head decision. This is not just believing facts. This, is a, this comes from your heart. If it doesn't come from your heart, then you're just simply praying a prayer that doesn't really amount to a whole lot. But if they mean it with your heart, and, and we get this from, from Scripture, because it says if you will believe in your heart that God is... That, that you are made right with God and it is by confessing with your mouth that you are saved and everyone who will call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. So important questions that you, you may need to ask at the end of a session like that after you go through and share the scriptures with someone, uh, depending on what you discern in the conversation, um, it's just uh, remember, and that's the thing, you gotta be discerning, remember to be discerning. So these are some of the things that you can share with them. Um, you know, another thing I always ask is, does everything I'm talking about make sense to you? If they say, if they don't understand, then, you know, you, you may need to take a little more time with them. Are you, are you willing to turn away from your sin and turn to God? And, and they're either going to answer that question like, like I did the first time when the pastor tried to leave me the Lord. And I said, nope, <laughs> I'm not willing to let go of my stuff. You know, I knew, I knew that salvation meant that I couldn't get drunk with my buddies. I knew that wasn't going to line up. I, I couldn't do a lot of things. So I actually told him no. Because <laughs> I knew that I was going to have to give up a lot of things in my life. So I went to work the next day. Had this feeling like, man, what did I just reject? I had this feeling like I just somebody's tried to give me a million dollars. And I said, I don't want it. And that feeling never left me. See, I thought it was this feeling that what did I turn down? But it was the Holy Spirit going, prompting me and just working in my life. And for the first time, I came home that night. I, I like to floored Stephanie because I came home. I said, I'm going to go to church with you tonight. And you got to understand, I'd never been to church. I wouldn't even go to, to a wedding or a funeral unless I absolutely, it was imperative that I had to go, okay? I would not walk in the doors of a church. So for me to say that, it was God that night. It, you know, April 26, 1988 is the night I prayed to receive Christ. And it's never been the same since. And so, you know, these are very good things to share so that people understand, you know, what does that make sense to you? Are you willing to turn for your faith you're right now? And the Bible says that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So it's important um, that they understand, that, again, that saying a prayer won't make you a Christian. But placing your faith in Jesus Christ makes you a Christian. And you can help them pray a prayer to receive Christ, um, you know, by praying a prayer like the one that, the example prayer that's uh, like the one below. And I always understand there's no, there's no magic in this prayer. I'll make sure they understand this. If you don't mean this from your heart, it, it's just going to be another decision that you made that will end up falling to the wayside. But the last step in salvation counseling is to encourage them to be scripturally baptized. Very important. That's the next step in Christian obedience. Um, at, at the end of your uh, lesson there, we have a section in baptism. I won't go over that tonight. You can read it. It's pretty simple. We won't take the time to go through that uh, tonight. But uh, let's talk about commitment counseling for rededication to grow towards spiritual maturity. This is probably the most important one. And uh, I'm doing really good on time. This is the one I want to spend the most time on tonight because it's the most important one. This is where a lot of confusion comes in. Um, the first thing you want to help someone to understand is that rededication is not frequenting how often you come to church. It's not increasing your church attendance, okay? So I always say it's rededication towards spiritual maturity. I want to get that into their head. Okay, yeah, I need to grow because I haven't been growing. That's why I'm, you know, ping-ponging back and forth and everything. So help them to understand it. it's, it's growing towards spiritual maturity. So a person making that commitment towards rededication is sometimes much more difficult to counsel. And a counseling for rededication will require you to really listen really well uh, to them, and uh, you know, remember one of the rules from week, uh, you know, from the well, not, not week one, but uh, the well, the first section that we just went over is be discerning, listen well, make sure you just really listen to what they're saying. So let's look at some different ways to counsel someone who has rededicated their life to Christ. The first one we're going to talk about is this: their need for salvation. Okay, so a person has come forward, and you walk them off to the side. And that you ask them, well, what commitment have you come to make? And I go, I've come to rededicate my life. 
to Christ. And, and it, it may be that person has never actually trusted Jesus Christ to begin with. Our job is not to interrogate. I want to I emphasize that. That's not our responsibility. Our job is to make sure that they understand when they leave this church that they're right with God. We don't want anybody walking around with some false assurance of their salvation. And, and so, uh, it, you know, praying a prayer. A lot of people think that praying a prayer or good people go to heaven. And uh, again, while it's never our place to make someone doubt their salvation, we would never want to do that. It is our responsibility to ensure that they have, in fact, accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. So many times, uh, people don't have an understanding of true salvation. And uh, this is why it's so important to share God's Word from the Bible so they understand. Um, here's the thing, though. Real life stories hit home. That's why you need to share your story. A lot of times... You can preach the greatest message there is out there, but they only listen to certain parts of it. But when you start telling real-life testimonies, I don't know what it is about it, but people always stop and listen. I've, I've shared, you know, the Word of God with people, and they're kind of, you know, you can tell they're kind of drifting off here and there. But when, I, when you share a story to someone that's happened to you, they listen. It's like the old E.F. Hutton commercial, man. People just listen to that. It's amazing. So you, that's why it's so important to share your testimony. But uh, let's talk about this scenario. It's, uh, this is a very common scenario. On your sheet there it says, Susan has come to rededicate her life to Christ. And during the session, the question is asked of her, well, when did you receive Christ as your Lord and Savior? She looks around the room and says, um, yeah, I think it's, uh, but, I, you know, I, well, I've always been a Christian. You know, obviously, Susan's salvation is, in, is, is kind of questionable there. And since our obligation is to ensure that, that person has accepted Jesus Christ, the right choice in that sense would just go ahead and counsel them for salvation. You can transition that by really easily by well, I'd like to share what happened to me. And that's where another good place where you can share your testimony with them. And, you know, but the thing is, no one has ever always been a Christian. We're not born a Christian in this world. So you don't become a Christian by the process of osmosis, right? So we're all born sinners. And, and a lot of times people think that just because they've been raised in church or they're just a good person that they're okay. But the Bible says, again, John 3, 3, unless one is born again, you cannot enter in the kingdom of God. So another question that might be appropriate in that kind of scenario when a person is not able to share their testimony with you, if they're not able to do that, uh, you could ask the question, well, suppose you were standing before God right now and he was to ask you, why should I let you in my heaven? What would you say? That's another one. And man, if they don't know, if you, they don't know the answer to that question right there, then I'm going to counsel them for salvation because the only, there's only one answer to that question, really. And, and, and people maybe can express it in, in different ways, but the only correct answer is that to trust in Jesus. If they haven't had a time in their life, when they've trusted Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior, then they never really have come to know Him. And so if they haven't given the correct answer or some form of that answer that you're comfortable with, wow, this person definitely had a point in time in their life when they came to know Jesus, they've just kind of allowed some things to come in their life that kind of, you know, got them off the path a little bit. But if you're not sure that that's what's happened, you just want to automatically just go ahead and counsel them for salvation. But this would be a great time by starting off again, sharing your testimony, uh, and I would start off like, you know, would you mind if I shared the story of how God changed my life? The, I'll guarantee they won't say no. And you can move and tell your two-minute uh, two testimony there. And, uh, you know, if you can, or, or like I said, you could go ahead and uh, if you're comfortable with what they've, they've told you, that they can clearly articulate a time and place that, uh, that they have trusted Jesus Christ, you go ahead and counsel for salvation. But let's look at counseling for rededication towards spiritual maturity. The Lordship of Christ is where you always want to begin with that. And at times Christians you know, may find themselves at a weakened time in a relationship with God and they feel the need to restore that relationship. That's true rededication. Uh, you know, they want to restore their life back to Jesus Christ by the Lordship. And uh, there are many reasons that some people, you know, feel their need to do this. And let's look at a couple of them. Here's some common uh, reasons for that. Stressful situations related to family, deaths, jobs, or even illnesses. Those are some reasons why people will drop out of church for a long period of time. And the longer you get away from God, you know how that happens, man. Stuff starts creeping back in your life and you get further and further away from us. So that's a real reason that people find yourself drifting off from God. Or sometimes you relocate. 
uh, and unable to find a church that you just fit. And so you get kind of burnt out and tired of that. There's a lot of people that fit into that. And so they just give up and they don't, they don't, they don't get a church for a long time. So they start drifting away because they don't have that fellowship and they don't have that close unity and that community uh, as believers. So they drift far away from it and they get to a point point realize, you know what? Man, I'm tired of this. And they come back and they want to rededicate their life to Christ for that reason. Sometimes tragedy, depression can spur these things. A lack of desire for the things of God, like you get away from reading your Bible or prayer or even worship. Uh, there may be a specific sin that people get involved in for a long period of time that causes them to drift away from God. Uh, you know, making a public commitment to grow uh, spiritually. Uh, you know, a lot of times people will make that commitment to grow spiritually, but they never did. So they feel a need to renew that. And those are all very good reasons for that. So the term rededication is, again, it's often misunderstood. It's not only uh, someone that has moved away from God, but has moved themselves from Christian community a lot of times. And so, but it also can be one that still attends church. Also still, they still pray. They still read their Bible, but yet, man, inside they have just moved and got cold on God. In other words, you and maybe we've all experienced this, and not that we start just going through the motions, but yet we're so far from God. We still come to church, we still read our Bible, but man, we've just moved so far from God. So it's important for that person rededicating their life to understand that rededication is moving towards spiritual maturity and not just regular church attendance. So a uh, biblical example of rededication, uh, have you ever found yourself in a place in your Christian life where you felt the need to rededicate your life to God publicly or even privately? Well, you're not alone. There are cases of confessed sin and rededication that are found in the Bible. Remember the story, you know, when Jesus told Peter that you know, you, you're going to deny me three times before the rooster ever crows. And he, remember what he said? No way. It's not going to happen, Lord. But uh, it, it actually did. But he says, but why can't I come now, Lord? He asked. He says, I'm ready to die for you. And Jesus answered, die for me. He says, I tell you the truth, Peter, before the rooster crows tomorrow morning, you will deny me three times that you ever even knew me. And so we can only imagine that deep depression and that remorse that Peter was experienced and after he denied Christ, the Bible says that he wept bitterly. And, and that word bitterly as it's used there, it's the kind of bitter remorse that if you were to actually lose a child, it's, that's what he felt. And so Peter was so just down and depressed because he had actually denied Lord. So let's look at Peter's uh, restoration and rededication of his relationship with Christ. Jesus restores the relationship after breakfast Asked, uh, after breakfast, Jesus asked Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said, yes, Lord, Peter replied. You know I love you. Then feed my lambs, Jesus told him. Verse 16, he says, Jesus repeated that question. Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said, yes, Lord, Peter said. You know I love you. Then take care of my sheep, Jesus said. The third time he asked, Simon, Son of John, do you love me? And Peter was hurt that Jesus had asked that question a third time. And he said, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, then feed my sheep. You see, the thing what's going on here, there's two different kind of words of love there. There's, a, there's agape, a love, which is a deep, deep love. And there's a phileo love, which is like, yeah, man, I love you, dude. That kind of love, you know. Well, it's not an intimate love. It's not like I love my wife. It's not like I love my sons. It's just, yeah, I love you. See, Jesus was asking, do you agape? Do you love me? Peter couldn't, he couldn't say that word. He says, yeah, you know I love you. He couldn't do it because why? He had denied him. He felt so bad that. That's why Jesus kept at it. He couldn't. So here's the beautiful part of the restoration about that. Jesus encouraged Peter by trusting his sheep to Peter. And so Jesus restores that relationship. He said, Peter, just go feed my sheep. And we all know how God used Peter, right? He used him to literally change the world, right? I mean, he went out there and evangelized the world. So there's that, so again, there's a picture of rededication or restoration to spiritual maturity. Man, Peter went out there and, and we're all sitting here as a process of that, that discipleship process because of Peter. So in the book of Acts, you can read how the Lord used Peter to start the whole New Testament church. And it's proof that Peter became more dedicated than ever before because of Christ's encouragement to feed his sheep. So as a counselor, you're supposed to be a source of encouragement to that person that is going to rededicate their life. So one of the most important aspects of counseling, rededication, is helping them to focus back on the lordship of Christ. And that's what we'll look at next, the lordship of Christ. If Jesus 
is not the Lord of your life, you, you're not going to obey him. It's pretty simple. And, uh, you know, if we don't love him, then we don't simply obey him. And, you know, the spiritual transformation is God at work in our life. And he says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is good and acceptable, perfect will of God. So spiritual transformation, uh, you know, trans transformed person is no longer conforms to the ways of this world, but is transformed by the renewing of the mind. And so many times it's, it's the circumstances that... Uh, and the cares of this world that draws people away from God in a loving relationship. So we need to feed, you know, we, if we feed that flesh, then the things of the world uh, are going to take dominance in our life. And that's how that people move away from the Lord. But when we fill ourselves with the things of the Spirit, man, we start moving back closer to the Lord. That's what happened to Peter. And so transformation is a process. It's just like, again, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. It, it's a process. So spiritual transformation is this... Uh, you know, it's a continuing process of being transformed into the likeness of Christ. A believer's spiritual transformation will include the decision to grow spiritually. So God wants to fill you with his spirit, and uh, God enables us to grow. And as a counselor, if you're not reading the word of God yourself, if you're not doing these things in your life, then you need to be if you're going to try and help somebody else do it. So it's very important. It's much easier to set an example that we are self are following, so we must exercise for godliness and uh, you know grow towards that spiritual maturity cannot happen apart from the Word of God. And to grow spiritually, you must desire to read God's Word as newborn babes desire the pure milk of the Word that you may grow thereby. And so it's moving towards that spiritual maturity, evidence of spiritual growth. Uh, that's one great thing that you want to talk to somebody about. You know, characteristics of spiritual growth. Uh, and desire to worship Him with our lives. And, and that's the thing. Do you, do you want to be there? Do you desire to be there? Do you desire to worship? Do you desire to read His Word and talk to Him? And so those are the things that you, wanna, you can also share with someone. But that's the most important part about counseling, though, is, is discerning whether this person is actually saved or not. There again, we're not there to judge them or, or to try to pressure them into a decision. We're just simply there to be a guide and to guide them into that situ situation that they need to make. Um, does anybody have any questions about this whole process? Yeah. Can you give me an example of your story? Uh huh. Good, good question. Yeah. You know, I start off telling them, you know, the first thing I tell them is that I was not raised in a Christian home. I live a very ungodly life. I, I led myself to become addicted to drugs and alcohol because I was a professional musician. I lived my life and made my living in the bars, and so therefore that was my lifestyle. I met my wife at a bar, and uh, we, got, we started dating, and then long story short, we actually got married. Wasn't well, about six months later. She comes home to me and says, you know, she went out and started going visiting to all these churches. I'm going, yeah, baby, you go ahead and do that. That's not for me. You can do it. Just don't push that stuff on me. And uh, so she came home one night. She says, I got saved. I go, from what? I, had, I didn't know what that meant. You know, like, did some, some, you know, some guys rescue you or something or somebody try to, you know, uh, rescue you from a car wreck or what's the deal? I don't I didn't understand. She's not. Nah, she goes, tonight I gave my heart and life to Jesus Christ. I'm going to live my life from him, for him from now on. And I go, like, whatever. Just don't push that stuff on me. We're cool. But I knew in my heart right then that it wasn't going to work. Our marriage was pretty much done. And so uh, after about a period of six months, I saw a change in her life. I saw somebody that was different, and I couldn't put my finger on it. Only thing I knew, whatever that girl had, I did not have in my life. And so I began to ask questions. And I thought I was curious but that was the Holy Spirit starting the work in my life. And I asked questions about the Bible. And some she could answer, some she couldn't. The ones she couldn't, she invited people from the church. They came over, they shared with me. And it was finally the pastor came and he shared the word of God. And everybody else helped me to understand somewhat. But it wasn't until somebody took the time to take me from the very beginning of Adam and Eve and understood what happened and, 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 and why we were sinners and what I needed to do to restore that relationship back to Christ. It wasn't until he took me through the scriptures and I understood that he tried to lead me to the Lord that night. But again, I knew that it was cost me my lifestyle. I knew enough to know that, so I turned it down that night and, and it was the next day that I went to church. I found myself just praying and, and asking God to come into my life 
and he saved me and he changed me. My life has never been the same, man. He saved me from my drug addiction, my alcohol, all that stuff. And he made me a new creation. And that's pretty much it right there. Yeah. <laughs> it is hard to believe. I would agree with that, man. But you know, uh, yeah. But here's the, here's the two things that do. That will either help them to understand. And again, you don't have to have that kind of testimony. Your testimony doesn't have to be like mine or Pastor Eric's where we came from this crazy radical lifestyle. It could have been, you know what, I was raised in church all my life. And I sat there in a the pew. But one day... God spoke to my heart, and I asked him to come in my life, and, and I had a stronger desire to live for God now. It could be that. It, you know, it's just there's this point in time in your life where you, you trusted Jesus Christ. And, and so it, it's going to do one or two, and this is all what counseling is. It revolves around you sharing your testimony. Please understand that. You don't have to memorize all these scriptures, and don't let that intimidate you. But you just have to be able to share simply. You can lead someone to Christ by never, and I, I don't, it's not my favorite way, but I've shared Christ with people in an airport, not having a Bible on me. I just simply share what happened to me. That's all I did. And, and people will receive, man, I want that. I, that's what's missing in my life. They, it clicks with them sometimes. And, uh, and so the Bible tells us to, to, to hide the Word of God in our heart that we might not sin against Him. There's another good reason why we hide the Word of God in our heart. If you don't have a Bible, you can still dislike yesterday. Dummy me, the pastor, didn't have my Bible with me. But man, you know, God helped me bring it back to memory. And I could, you know, you could, I could share that with them. But your, your story, if they understand that they don't have that, see, that's, what I, that's how I came to know Christ. I saw a change in her life, and I knew I didn't have what she had, and I wanted it. I just wanted it. And so that's all you really have to do, and just simply take them through some of the Scriptures and say, hey, man, this is all you have to do. The Bible just says if you'll just, you know, just, it's a heart decision that if you'll just trust God with your heart and, and with your mouth, confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord, you shall be saved. And you can just share it as simple as that. And so that's, that's the main part about counseling, whether they come for salvation or rededication. If they come for rededication, man, the, the, just encourage them. There's some places on that laminated part that you can, some scriptures that you can help share with them that'll, that'll encourage them. And, and tell them about the next step. Ask, hey, even if they come down for rededication, have you ever been baptized? Or if there's salvation, your next step is baptism. You want to always lead them. And on your clipboard there, there are these, you've probably seen them laid on the, uh, the seats of the, of the church several times. A great thing, you want to hand them this, give them that. There also will be another letter that's actually folded up behind the uh, commitment record there. This is another thing that I, we give them that, will also tell them their next steps. And even if you don't have a lot of time with them, all you have to do, the only time you have with them is to get them to fill out that card and maybe share a little bit about what happened to you in your testimony. Give them that sheet of paper. It will at least, you, they'll leave with some kind of resource in their hand about baptism and uh, their next steps as believers. So it's very important that you give them that also. Any other questions? Yeah. No, that's fine. Mm -hmm. that's okay I'm so glad you said that because that was one of the questions I asked her don't let me forget to say that so that, that's a great question uh, don't feel like you, gotta, you have to know anything because you don't um, that's what and, and I'm not saying that I know everything sometimes there's every now and then somebody will ask me something going like wow man I don't remember I have to go I'll get back with you uh, but never be afraid to, to say you know what I'm not sure about that let me get let me get you with Pastor Don or Stephanie and, and just simply refer us to them and, and we will have our, our church elders that you can also refer them to and so that's a great question so don't feel like you have to know everything you know just just tell them hey you know what that's a really good question. I'm not real sure, but let me get you with, you know, whoever and, uh, and, ha and have you meet them. And, and hopefully we'll know how to answer their question <laughs> so we won't keep passing around the church. But uh, no, great question. Thanks for asking that. Uh, any others? I see Daniel's wheels turning back there. <laughs> it's really not as complicated or as hard as you think it is. I know at first couple of times it's kind of intimidating. And if you'd like, um, 
unless there's like a bunch of people that come down. Uh, if, if, if you're a guy, if you want to come with me, if it's like one guy, and I take a, me, you're welcome to tag along or a couple of guys and, and uh, you know, and, and just kind of walk you through it. Or Stephanie, you, you know, y'all can tag with Stephanie and uh, she can help, you know, you can just sit there and listen to her, how she would handle the situation. Um, here, here's the thing, guys. This is why this is so important. This is why I would uh, really ask you guys to pray about this because as you probably witnessed many times, we have a lot of people that come down several occasions. You ever notice who walks off to the side with them? <laughs> Myself and Stephanie. And it's, you cannot counsel. You, group counseling is not a great scenario. Uh, it just doesn't work. All we can do is get them to fill out a card and hopefully, you know, they'll read my email or hopefully they'll answer my phone call or whatever the case. But here's the thing. The, the best time to talk to someone is when they are willing to make the commitment. Because here's what everybody knows, like, after you make a commitment or, uh, you know, like, for instance, after a person gets saved, remember what happens, man, Satan starts to attack. If we don't have people to, to explain to them what their next steps are going to be, they're probably gonna go out there and flounder. This is the best time to help, not only help them to understand because God's dealing with their heart right then and there, Getting back with them later is not, not the best scenario. It's right then and there. And, uh, but getting back with them in that point, and it's, just, it's, just a, it's just a blessing to have enough people to be able to help people to their next step and understand the decision that they're making. And so it's just really important that we have people. We're, we really don't have much. We have only have, probably have four or five people right now that are counseling. We really needed, hopefully by the end of the year, we're going to have maybe a team of 30 people. I'd like to have 10 people per service. That would be awesome to have that. And so that's what we're working towards. Also working towards have people lead this, this particular ministry who are willing to lead it. And that would be uh, a really good thing that we, we want to eventually work towards. So it's not dependent upon me. The last thing I want it to be is dependent upon me being there. So that's why we need to have, you know, trained counselors. But the more you do this, I'm telling you, there's going to be some times where people are going to come down the aisle and they're going to come to, hey, I need to just attend church more often. And you're going to get to lead them to the Lord. I can't tell you how many times that's happened with us. And, and I, I don't want to always be the one that steals all those blessings. You, you guys could share in those blessings. Just like I said, we led that lady to the Lord yesterday, uh, the week before. Stephanie led, led a lady out in the parking lot to the Lord that left the service, question marks running because of what Leo had shared. And uh, man, she just wasn't, she wanted to nail it down. She wasn't sure. So right out there in the back of the parking lot in the back of this building, Stephanie led her to the Lord right there. So uh, it's the greatest blessing it, it, to be able to do that or to help somebody walk through a difficult time. But just maybe some stuff just happened in their life and they got away. You know, you, you might be able to refer them to, to, to celebrate recovery. It's just getting them to those next steps. That's, that's what the main thing is. So don't let it intimidate you. Embrace it. And it's just, it's, it's, uh, there's no greater joy than to be able to do that. But I don't know how many times have you had the privilege to lead someone, Lord, maybe you've never had that privilege. But I guarantee you, sooner or later, if you do this, you will lead someone to the Lord. It's, it's amazing. So 